to today. I'm very happy and always excited to be asked to speak about a topic that I feel really passionate about, and that's memory and dementia care. Um, just a real quick elevator speech about myself. Um, I have a degree in social work. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I also have a graduate certificate in gerontology. Um, I have been an administrator for dementia care programs within assisted livings, independent livings, and skilled nursing. I um, have been a certified instructor for several different uh, modalities of dementia care, um, one being uh, Crisis Prevention Institute's Dementia Capable Care, as well as the Best Friends uh, model of care. And I'm a certified Montessori dementia care practitioner. And now that I'm exhausted from just saying that and making myself look really good on paper, I'm just really old fashioned me. Um, and that's the one thing that I really do love about memory care is that I really do get to involve myself in the present moment and just be able to be myself alongside somebody else. And I think that's the most important thing that you can do as a caregiver living uh, a life caring for somebody with dementia. Um, so I am going to attempt to share my screen here. <clears throat> And I'm gonna make sure before I get started that you can all see the presentation. Looks good, Jamie, go for it. All right. So today we're gonna to talk about practical tips on how to approach the challenges of caring for someone with dementia and understanding how the degenerative disease uh, process works. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how hospice can help in that process. So uh, just making sure that we're right on board, you can see this next slide says understanding dementia. And I always start with this because I really want to be able to share that dementia itself is not a disease process. It's really an umbrella term for a set of symptoms that affect memory, cognition, and social abilities on a level that is severe enough to impact daily functioning. So just like, um, what was the example that I read yesterday I thought was pretty, pretty profound. Just like um, coronary artery disease is a disease of the heart, dementia is a disease of the brain. And they're caused by different disease processes such as Alzheimer's disease, which is the most prevalent type of um, dementia. Um, vascular disease, which has to do with your circulatory system, your heart, um, and can be uh, brought about by risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure, um, coronary artery disease. Um, Parkinson's disease can bring about uh, signs and symptoms of dementia, Lewy body dementia, and frontotemporal dementia, just to name a few. Um, I will say uh, I've had a lot of questions over the years of people asking me, well, why does it matter what type I have if the symptoms are the same and the approach to care is similar in terms of managing symptoms? Um, each one of these disease process takes just a little bit different trajectory and has different risk factors. So I do find that it is important the more you know and the more education you have, um, the more you can be prepared to develop specific interventions that can be really meaningful and be more helpful than something that is a little bit more broad. So I always like to start off also thinking about who is our person? So I just invite you to take a couple minutes here and think about that person in your life, whether it's a spouse, it's a parent, it's a, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, or um, for a lot of people, it's what we do for work or caregivers for other people. Um, I'm talking about our nurses and our home health aides and our social workers, because a lot of times when you have somebody in your life, you're a caregiver um, for, um, it can be really any role, any one of us can be a caregiver at any time. So how many of you have heard of the boomers and the silver tsunami and this wage of, and this wave of people who are coming and the, they're, we're just gonna be overrun by aging people. Um, I like to think that we are fill, a country filled with a lot of wisdom as we have a lot of our, our aging population is getting larger. Um, but we're specifically talking to people who have the birth year between 1946 and 1964, which puts the age range about 56 to 75. So what this really means is the silver tsunami isn't coming. They're already here. We are already seeing a lot of people um, who are older adults who are needing more services. 
one thing we see is that people are also living longer, but not always necessarily healthy, healthier. We see that resources can be scarce. Um, people are seeking care from multiple sources, um, healthcare system, residential settings. Um, so our, our nursing homes, our assisted livings, our independent livings, and our home and community-based services which is our private duty, maybe home care, and more specifically to our organization, hospice services, to try and figure out, um, I have a person that I, that I love, that I'm caring for, that is living with dementia, and I need some support. So these are the resources that are out there. And I don't know if anybody is, has had this experience, but it's also troubling because it's kind of, it's scarce out there to find resources and have enough resources that are quality to really be able to help support our caregivers who have somebody in their life that is living with dementia. Um, one thing you always will hear me say as well, I talk about people who are living with dementia. I try to use more positive language as opposed to suffering from, because that's what I like to think is that our people with dementia are still living. They're still um, deserving of love, deserving of quality life and quality care. Um, and that's how I really like to frame um, what we do when we work together to create a better world for people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, I will say the care that we that we see people looking for is really dependent largely on your ability to pay. Um, that's one of the things that I think that we do need to change in our in our system is you shouldn't have to go bankrupt to be able to provide good quality care for somebody. Um, and also availability of services. We all, um, I think, have been talked out about COVID, but the impact that COVID did have on our healthcare industry and the availability of, of people to be able to provide these services have, have changed the um, access that we have to them. Um, there is an increase in older adults um, compared to the year 2000. The number of adults aged 85 and older has almost doubled which means we have a larger amount of people who are looking for resources that either maybe don't have the ability to pay or if they do, they can't locate them. And when you have this older amount of people, that means that invariably you are gonna have more people who might have um, a diagnosis of dementia. And that really complicates the typical caregiving situation because the one thing we'll talk about is that cognition, your ability to process, um, either incoming or process outgoing um, communication um, is the drive, number one driver for all functions. And we'll have a whole slide and talk about what those functions are. So I wanna spend just a minute also talking about who is our caregiver. Um, these are some uh, um, updated facts and figures from alzheimers.org. If you go to their website, um, they put out a yearly report. It's called the Alzheimer's Disease Facts and Figures Report. Um, and I think it's very important because it really gives us a picture of who is our caregiver. So right now, more than 11 million Americans and caregivers um, are out there um, for someone living with um, Alzheimer's disease, or you'll often see ADRD, which is Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So that's 11 million Americans are caregivers. That is a huge number of people. 41% of these people have a household income of less than $50,000. So again, when you're taking a look at um, how to care give, the ability to find, locate, and pay for these services can be really difficult if you don't have the money to pay for them. 30% um, of caregivers are age 65 and older. And we'll talk about caregiving, how it also has a very large physical component. And so it there does present some safety issues for being able to do some of those heavier lifting tasks of caregiving. 60% are in a long-term relationship or a marriage. Um, and I think that also speaks to when people are um, caregiving, that commitment and that level of love that's also in that relationship. Two thirds of caregivers are women. And then a quarter of caregivers are what's referred to as that sandwich generation caregivers. So those are our caregivers that are caring for two different types of people, those middle-aged folks who maybe are caring for parents and then caring for their own children at the same time. So in that, they're in that dual role um, of, of caring for other people. So 
one thing that I find really um, important to note Let's see. In 2022, there was an estimated 18 billion hours of informal, and what I mean by informal is unpaid, um, caregiving assistance that's valued at $339.5 billion. So I'm just going to take a minute and, and ask the group, how many of you think that is just an astronomical amount? That is, that is multiple industries, and that's just unpaid unpaid care for caregivers that that they're that care that they're providing. Because of that, there can be unintended consequences from caregiving. As you'll see, I have a little bit of a lag time here. One of those unintended consequences is monetary. So um, what this means is as a caregiver, we there is a lot of um, data around that you have a, can experience a monetary loss because maybe you're supplementing care or you're helping pay out of your own pocket, especially maybe if you're in that sandwich generation and you're trying to piece together care for somebody. Um, another unintended consequence from caregiving is um, your own health. Uh, they find that when you are a caregiver for somebody else, the physical and emotional toll that you go through can can really take take away from your own phys physical and emotional health. I, can I just ask, does anybody feel comfortable sharing just by a raise of hands if that's something that that they've experienced? It takes a lot to care for somebody. Um, it's a wonderful gift. Um, it's an amazing gift. And when, when I speak to those people who are in long-term relationships, um, I really want to point out that it's a real commitment. It's a labor of love, but it is realistic for caregivers to be able to, to look to what support they have so that they can care for themselves as well. Because I cannot say it enough. If you are a caregiver and you don't take care of yourself, then that's gonna impact the care for the person you're trying to provide. So be kind to yourself, create space for you to be able to um, talk, to, to engage in self-care. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, later on as well. There are economic consequences. So um, a lot of people who are caregivers miss work and that impacts different industries. When I when I refer back to those two thirds being women, um, that can impact uh, our women, our woman caregivers who maybe could be at work and, and working on maybe some advancements for themselves, but they're not really able to do that because they have to put aside certain things to be caregivers as well. And then because of that, it really deepens social and racial disparities. So I talked about, you know, what challenges do we face as caregivers and how do we manage them? I made that comment that cognition really drives um, all function and it impacts so many different areas of somebody's ability to live every day. We think about um, one of the ones that we talk about is eating and drinking. Um, if you if your cognition is impacted and you're not able to um, think about, OK, well, I need to eat. Maybe you don't feel hungry. Maybe that part of your brain has um, been affected and you're not able to eat or drink anything. Um, or maybe your physical self has changed and you have problems swallowing food at a normal texture. Um, activities of daily living um, or your what's commonly referred to as ADL care. Um, so your ability to get dressed, to take yourself to the bathroom, to know when to shower, to brush your teeth. Think about all of those things that you do in the morning to get up and get ready. Can I just, if anybody wants to feel free to, or feels open to be able to share, how many, how many minutes does it take you to get ready in the morning? And how many different tasks do you go through and you switch between um, to get out the door? I know for me, <laughs> um, 
it's a lot. You know, you shower, you have to wash your hair, actually walk yourself through all of those steps. Even just one simple task. Think about brushing your teeth. You have to know where your toothbrush is. You have to take the cap off. You have to squeeze the tube onto the toothpaste. Um, I'm, I don't want to pick on anybody, but generally you have to rinse your toothbrush with water and get it wet before the toothpaste, right? I've met people who don't, and I find it a little weird, but no judgment. It's a no judgment zone. Um, but there are so many little steps. And when you're, you have a, a, a disease of the brain that impacts your ability to think through those things, um, you're going to have a more difficult time being able to do something. And we'll, we'll talk about how that can be very frustrating for caregivers, because it's something so simple that we've done our whole lives. And if you maybe, let's say you have a partner and you say, well, go brush your teeth and you find that person in the bedroom because they lost their way to the bathroom, or maybe they did get to the bathroom and they couldn't find the toothpaste, or maybe they're struggling taking the cap off. All of these little steps can be impacted, and it really takes that step-by-step um, -step assistance. And day after day, for our caregivers, that can be emotionally exhausting and that can be tiring. Um, instrumental activities of daily living. So those are the things that, um, like writing a checkbook, managing your finances, um, creating a calendar of events. Those are things that are impacted um, by this disease process. Socialization, um, the ability to really make connections because maybe you don't know what to say next or maybe you can't follow the conversation. Maybe you're in a restaurant and and the, the, there's too much going on, too much stimulation and it can be upsetting. Um, so being able to make those connections. Humans are social creatures. And so it is very important to recognize how important quality of life and being with other people can be. And when that's impacted, how somebody could potentially withdraw and their quality of life could be affected. Um, the ability to communicate. And when we talk about behaviors um, and, and, and things that um, are also come with this disease process, a lot of times it is because there's an inability to communicate. Um, I've worked with a lot of people who um, you've seen become antsy or walk around or pace or get angry. And a lot of times we found that it was because they really couldn't communicate. They had to go to the bathroom. They could, they didn't have the ability to put that physical sensation with the mental ability of, oh, I'm recognizing what this physical sensation is and I don't know what to do about it. And so really being able to listen to the communication or the behaviors to try and find out um, what you can do to help somebody is really important. Emotions. Um, emotions are impacted. Again, the ability to maybe process um, what is going on. Uh, different parts of the brain can be affected and that can affect things like your serotonin levels. Um, it can create different types of depression. Um, generally, there is a theory in dementia care called the um, progressively lowered stress threshold. And that means that when you have dementia and there's so much coming in to have to process, whereas maybe it's going to take a lot for me to hit my stress threshold and I'm like, ah. for somebody who's living with dementia or memory care, that stress threshold is a lot lower. And so maybe just the frustration of not knowing where to find my toothbrush or, you know, having somebody tell me I need to eat breakfast. What I remember, I just ate breakfast yesterday, even if I didn't, maybe it's just going to take those two things to make me hit that stress threshold. And then you're going to see me get angry or cry or get frustrated. And again, I want to, you know, you may see behaviors and um, I feel behaviors have a real negative connotation for those living with dementia. They're present, right? But we all have behaviors, right? So how many of you have um, had to drive on Michigan roads lately? Yeah. So how many of you have gotten frustrated, right? So that's a behavior, it, that to me is no different than if you are somebody with dementia and you're living in a specific reality and something happens to you and you're expressing frustration. So a lot of times behaviors are a normal reaction to that person's reality. I can tell you I've gotten into what I'll call disagreements with my better half, sometimes my worst half, 
And, you know, my perception of the situation isn't his reality. And I think about how closely related that is to dementia care, because sometimes people are looking at things through their own lens um, and it creates a response. And so how do we uh, move forward just like we would in any other relationship to try and seek to understand what's happening with somebody so that we can move through things in a really positive way? Sleep. So I will say that this is one of the most challenging things that is um, for people who are around the clock caregivers in, in house settings and even in residential settings. Sleep for a caregiver is so important. How many of you can go regularly with broken sleep? Yeah, sleep is so essential to our, our, our well-being as humans, not only physical, emotionally, but when you have somebody who is living with dementia and has um, sleep disturbances, that can really take a quick toll on people with with um, who are caregivers. And so that, Im that impact can be really felt really deep. In relationships, um, I think when you have had a longstanding relationship and you're caring for somebody with, with dementia, your relationship changes as a caregiver. And so a lot of times you really have to know um, when to reach out for assistance so that you can keep your relationship strong. I've worked with a lot of couples um, where one um, spouse is a caregiver for the other and their relationship changes. And sometimes that's a loss you have to go through um, because you're losing somebody that you've maybe spent your life with or a long time with, or you know, even if it's a short time, you're losing things about that relationship. And so that can be uh, multiple losses that happen over a long sustained time. And that can be really difficult. Um, I think the one thing that has always stuck out to me when I've worked with couples who are in these caregiving relationships and dementia is involved, and just that ability to be able to sit with each other and have those everyday conversations um, and be able to connect on that really emotional level. So um, it, it's really important to realize that this, this disease processes that cause dementia really can have a global effect on somebody's ability to function because your brain drives everything. So next I wanna go ahead and, and kind of cover some of those more broad areas and talk about some tips, um, some things that can be helpful in working um, and, and supporting people who are living with dementia. So a symptom that we often we that is often present in any one of those disease processes is forgetfulness, um, repeating yourself, or asking repetitive questions. So something that I find helpful is understanding that short-term memory um, loss is very prevalent among many forms of dementia. So your your the, what controls your brain and what is damaged is the ability to retain maybe what I had for breakfast. So we often find that um, memories will work backwards. So what I what I did talk about early about the different types of diseases that um, can it can bring about dementia and why it can be important to note the differences between those is um, I'll use vascular dementia for an example. Whereas Alzheimer's disease um, kind of has a trajectory of what parts of the brains it will, brain it will affect um, as it is a degenerative progressive disease. Um, vascular dementia is interesting because it has to do with the vascular system. And um, a lot of times it has a step-like pattern. And what I mean by that is somebody might have a baseline and then they'll say there's a stroke. So they might have a decline and then they have a new baseline, but maybe they have a small TIA or a transient ischemic attack or a mini stroke. Um, they have a lot of, a lot of names for, for these things. Um, and maybe it, it, it affects just one area of the brain. So sometimes that ability to have different memories can be affected. Um, what you can do is you can still, even though it's degenerative and it's a progressive disease, you can still promote good brain health. And that really happens through exercise and mental engagement. 
Um, I've heard a lot of times um, in working with people, well, they have dementia, they can't do that, which really necessarily um, isn't always true. There are abilities at every level of dementia, even when people are bed bound um, and very advanced, there's still abilities left. Um, I'll just use an example of a gentleman that I worked with who was bed bound and had advanced dementia. And he, um, everybody really thought that there was just nothing, nothing there. And there just was nothing there. And I started doing a little bit of digging and working with his wife. And I noticed that there were pictures on the wall taped up next to his bed. And he used to love to go camping and, and um, canoeing with his family. They used to take a lot of water trips. So we got one of those water bags. And I put it on the bedside table and I just put his hands on the water bag. And very slowly, I noticed that he just would push back and forth on the bags. And it was so minimal a movement where it wasn't a lot, but it was still the ability that he felt something. He felt that water moved. Now, I can't be for certain that that brought comfort, <laughs> but I can tell you it, I, I saw it connect with him. And so you really have to be able to seek out those experiences and those um, opportunities to be able to connect with somebody on a very personal level. And even if you don't know for sure, if it's going to do any good, if it's not doing harm, why wouldn't we try? So um, also exercise is really good for people who are living with dementia, especially when it comes to sleep. Um, because if you don't have that normal physical or mental stimulation, you are going to find that somebody will, will by default fall asleep. And so being able to be active uh, mentally and physically is also going to help that promote good rest at night. Um, you can encourage for people who are maybe more earlier to moderate stage, keeping a calendar of events to help remember important dates. Um, so that can be more difficult and it takes a lot of um, over, oversighting for that person to initiate. But another person that I worked with, um, what we did is they had, they had difficulty remembering what they were doing from day to day. And so we had a calendar for that person and every day when they did something, we would just have them write it in. So they always had a reference of maybe what was doing. And then when they looked at that calendar, even though they couldn't remember what they were doing, they saw their own handwriting being like, oh, look at, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> And that made them feel really good. Um, this is a difficult one um, <clears throat> for, some, for some people, especially when you are a caregiver 24-7. Um, I will also say that in working with a lot of couples, the most difficult decision is knowing when to live apart and to allow somebody else to take that caregiving to preserve that relationship. Um, because caregiving is... It is a, it's a gift, but again, it, 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 it's a lot. Um, so I just say, you know, avoid responding with frustration to promote the dignity of that individual. Um, you know, not, not every, not everybody, um, well, I will say most, anybody with dementia isn't doing this purposefully. It's not a purposeful thing on their part to not be able to remember or to repeat themselves. Um, it's a brain disease and we need to figure out how do we support that person. And when I get to the self-care, that's why it's important for you to be able to care for yourself so that you don't get to your stress threshold. Um, help build and promote familiar routines for the person to follow. So if I always showered at night and then all of a sudden I wanted to get up and get ready for the day and shower in the morning, that's going to be really difficult because I do have a, a lot of folks that I've lived with have like this muscle memory. Think about every day you get up and you the things that you kind of do the same and you think about working on autopilot. You know, every day I, I pay attention to the road, but I might, you know, drive and just kind of let my mind wander because I'm taking the same same uh, road every day. Um kind of promoting and figuring out what is familiar to that person and in terms of a routine can be really helpful. And then I talk about therapeutic fibbing. So therapeutic fibbing can be used when memory loss is more advanced and an individual may forget loved ones are deceased and maybe begin to search in or ask for them repetitively. A lot of people feel really uncomfortable. I don't want to lie to somebody. Um, 
how to say this the best way. I don't want to lie to anybody either, but I also don't want to do put somebody in a position who, um, to feel a large amount of grief if it's unnecessary. Um, but in also being honest with somebody, there are there are different therapeutic ways to be able to avoid difficult situations. One individual that I worked with, um, she her husband had passed, and her family didn't want to tell her after they initially told her because it was a very traumatic experience that they didn't want her to live through every single day. Um, so what we did was when she would ask where her husband was, um, we found out what he liked to do. And he did two things. He always went to work and he loved to go fishing. So anytime she would ask where her husband was, we would say, you know, he likes to fish, didn't he? I think he might be out there. Why don't we go do this? And we'll we'll get to that later. Um, and we'll we'll see maybe when when he'll come back. And it wasn't necessarily a lie, but it was an opportunity for her to feel like he was doing something that was very meaningful to him his whole life, while at the same time not having to remind her every day that he that he had passed. Um, so everybody has a different feeling about that, but I just want to normalize that that is something that is, that can be a huge relief, um, for caregivers and for people living with memory loss alike. Oh, sorry. I lost my clicking. Um, another, uh, symptom that we see are changes in emotional state and personality changes. Um, so the first one is really try to understand what has caused a change in emotional state. Um, you know, did something happen? Did you see something on the TV and it was triggering? Um, did somebody say something to you? So really just sometimes asking. Sometimes that person won't be able to communicate and you might not never know. You might not ever know. So in that case, being able to validate what the person is feeling is real, even if it's not based in reality. Um, I think I think it's very important for somebody to feel like they're heard. So, you know, I always think about this example is, you know, if if I'm if I'm in a room and somebody says something to me and I feel it's a, in a hurtful tone and maybe it wasn't, you know, just and I share it with somebody instead of just saying, that's not real, that didn't happen, just being like, oh, I'm sorry you felt that way. Everybody wants to feel like they have somebody who is going to support them. Um, promote engagement in positive activities of interest. So really find out what somebody likes to do. And, um, you know, to try and take their mind off of what might be challenging them. Um, I always say avoid challenging that person's reality that can often bring more distress. Instead, join the journey. Um, this is really difficult when you do have, so Parkinson's um, disease and Lewy body dementia a lot of times have hallmarks of hallucinations. And they're things that really aren't there. Um, and a lot of times with Lewy body dementia, those hallucinations can be of small animals, it can be of bugs, and small children tend to be a theme in that type of dementia. And so I have worked with people before where, you know, they're very distressed by the fact that, that there are, there are, there were bugs on the floor. And, you know, we'd have a lot of staff that would say, there are no bugs on the floor. There are no bugs on the floor. Um, you know, if I'm seeing bugs and you're telling me they're not there, <laughs> that might even make me more mad. But what would be the harm? And this is, again, where that therapeutic fibbing come in to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to shoo them out. I'm just going to shoo them right out. And sometimes that could be helpful. Um, except people can change with the disease processes. Um, I've also worked with a lot of people whose family have said, oh my gosh, mom never would have said that <laughs> in her whole life. Mom never would have swore like that. Um, and so people do change with this disease process. When you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. Um, sometimes personalities can be exacerbated so they can become more prevalent. Um, and sometimes people just become the complete opposite. Um, providing simple reassurances with empathy goes a long way. Again, just being able to say, you know, I'm here for you. Um, 
how many, I will tell you one of my favorite things to do is learn how to share a comfortable silence with somebody. Cause sometimes just being present with somebody in that moment, just so they don't feel lonely or they feel like somebody is there listening can be so meaningful and just allowing that space for them to express what's going on. Um, I think we react to negative emotions just as a society, you know, like when people are crying or having a, a tough moment, it's, oh, I got to fix this. Oh, what are, you know, why are you crying? You stop crying. Maybe somebody needs to be able to have a space to re release some anxiety or release some sadness. We don't know what goes on in the in in somebody's brain that is living with dementia, right? We don't know what maybe they're reconciling towards end of life. Um, we don't know. We can't be inside of their brain. So maybe we just need to be able to accept and then help them move on. Um, let's talk about fluctuations in hygiene and having physical challenges, because this is honestly one of the biggest areas that I find people struggling with is showering and going to the bathroom. Um, if you notice a person that you're caring for needs hygienic support, you can ask them discreetly if they might need assistance. I will tell you a lot of the time, 99% of the time, it's going to be, no, I just showered or no, I don't need help. Because again, that person's reality is that they don't know they need help. They don't have that awareness to know that they need to be able to do something about it. Or maybe they do, but getting started is really difficult because their brain can't process, again, those steps for those activities of daily living. I always say provide space for the person to be as involved as possible in their own personal care. Um you know, I'm just going to put it really bluntly on the line, but you know, when our bodies are our bodies, there's not a lot of people that I want to see me without clothes on or to have to help me do something personal and vulnerable, like clean, clean up after using the restroom or, you know, having to wash my private areas in a shower. Those are things that like are, are very personal. Um, and not everybody feels comfortable, um, just saying, okay, go to town, clean me up that has not been something that's been really widely accepted in my line of work. So I think being able to be there and use your cues, have supplies available, you know, hand people washcloth, washcloths, you'll find that when you do these small things, a lot of times that brain and muscle memory can take over. Um, inquire to ensure they have preferred care items avail available. One thing is, is if somebody hands me cheap generic face cream, I will not use it. So if you want me to have moisturized skin, you know, I would like you to make sure that I have maybe something really nice, like some Clinique cream or something that I've always used. Or maybe, um, you know, I always used Crest toothpaste. And if you try to give me Pepsodent, I'm not going to brush my teeth because it's not familiar to me. So really trying to pick out those things that are going to resonate with somebody that are going to be able to cue in that brain um, using that sensory kick in that is going to tell somebody to do something. Um, an example that one of my um, colleagues I worked with a while ago get, always told me this story about her grandma and that how many of you grew up having a bar of soap and a soap dish, you know, that really kind of slimy bar that sat in water that we really felt cleaned our hands well. Well, you know, her, her grandma did not recognize that pump thing on the wall. And so she would never use the soap. So my colleague went, went to her home and took her a soap dish and a bar of caress soap because that was what was familiar. That was what she knew how to do. And so playing off that helped um, her, her, her grandma remember to wash her hands, which was very important to her her whole life because she never ate without clean hands, which none of us should do, but I'm just saying. Um, engaging in positive hygiene practices together. So, you know, again, using hand washing as an example, you know, if somebody, if you see somebody else doing it too, chances are that society, oh, okay, it's normal, let's wash our hands. This works a lot too um, when it comes to eating, although we're not really talking about hygienic now, but when you have people who are um, struggling to remember to eat, being able to sit in a social situation and see those visual and verbal cues and use the smell of food can sometimes be um, really great cues to be able to complete those things. And then identify a support system of the person if more in-depth assistance is needed. 
and identi identify safety hazard in, share in shared spaces. So uh, I always talk about keeping like razors um, cap just because if there's a lack of awareness, you want to just be really cautious. Um, so how can caregivers be prepared? Um, I always talk about assess where you are as a caregiver. What is your knowledge and what is your commitment to caregiving? It is entirely okay. And as caregivers, I always tell people, give yourself permission. If you're not fully committed and you need help, you are going to be a better caregiver, a healthier caregiver, if you accept help. And it's okay, not one, it's very difficult for one person to be everything another person needs 100% of the time. Even in the best of health, if there's no disease process, it's hard to be the best person for somebody else 100% of the time. And it's okay to say, I've done this for a long time and I need to take a step back. That is a kindness for yourself and for the person you're caring for. Um, we talked about that level of frustration. It's really important to be able to, um, you know, know if you're hitting a limit so that you can step away and get the help that you need for yourself because limits might come. Um, which is important to be able to, to lean on other people is identify your support system. Who do you have? Do you have children? Do you have friends, neighbors, um, uh, faith community, um, health systems? Um, find out what you lean on and, and know what can do what when. And I, I say that because it's easier to do now when you're not in a crisis situation and build those support systems and have those backup plans if you are not facing a crisis. Because in a crisis, it's really difficult to have to plan and make connections. Um, I always say have important documents available. So I, I stress this enough. Um, even if you find that you're in a space that you don't need one, having a power of attorney um, having, you know, your the person that you're caring for, knowing where those important papers are, knowing what their wishes are, if they have them documented, even better. Because again, you don't want to be in a crisis situation and nobody is named that decision maker when somebody's not able to make their own decisions. It just makes it a little bit more tough to get through sometimes those more bureaucratic healthcare systems. Um, having a quick list of go-tos. So just like um, we went through, the, through those last three screens, being able to say, okay, well, you know what? Grandma loves caress. I'm going to make sure that I go to Costco and hopefully they'll have, you know, an eight bar supply on hand and I can pick that up and have that available. Or, you know, I know that this person that I care for really loves to have coffee before they shower in the morning. I'm going to really figure out what the schedule, how I can build that schedule to make caregiving more successful. Um, if you do have a loved one who is living in a facility apart from you, um, it's okay to do all of these things as well, because even if you've given up caregiving full time, and let's say you're, um, you're, you have a, a loved one who is in an assisted living or a nursing home, you are still a caregiver in every sense of the word, because you're that person's person. So um, know that it is sometimes a kindness to know when to let other people step up and for you to step back. I want everybody who's a caregiver to know at some point, if they need to give themselves that permission, that is completely acceptable and completely okay. Um, again, awareness of self-care. Know what you need for you and figure out how can I make time for that. That really goes into identifying your support system and saying, listen, I need to get out of the house for two hours on Wednesdays because I need to do this for myself. Um, give yourself permission to do that. You as a caregiver are so important. Um, and that person you're caring for depends on you and you have to be good for you. And then again, finding that inspiration and that motivation in those really tough times, what is what is going to pick you up when you're feeling low? Is it a phone call with a friend? Is it a quote? Is it a, a, a Bible verse? Is it a phone call from somebody, a picture? Um, identify what's going to really keep you feeling um, motivated and inspired. Because I will tell you as caregivers, you are all amazing people. They're really Caregiving is such a gift. 
So I just want to spend a quick minute talking about um, about how hospice can help when people are living with dementia. So dementia care has a philosophy because it is a progressive and a degenerative disease process. Once you have that damage to the brain, there's generally no reversal. Um, we really focus on symptom management and quality of life, which is um, aligns really perfectly with hospice philosophy because hospice philosophy also focuses on symptom management and quality of life. And like we talked about, dementia is degenerative, meaning it gets worse over time. And generally people who um, decide to elect hospice services are in a similar situation. Um, if an individual experiences consistent decline and the goal is focusing on comfort, hospice can be appropriate. So in order to be able to uh, meet criteria for hospice, you do have to be able to uh, meet certain those decline criteria. Um, hospice provides symptom management, emotional support for the patient and family. We provide education on caregiving and resources. We have spiritual support and bereavement counseling. So um, identifying your people and your support system, if hospice is appropriate for you, um, that is something that um, is, is an available benefit. Um, so if eligibility criteria is met, hospice is a Medicare covered benefit. So I just put check with your hospice provider for questions you may have if you want to know if someone you are a caregiver for could be eligible. And hospice doesn't always mean, okay, um, you know, end is tomorrow, end is next week. That could be, that could be said for any one of us. This is about the decision to find a, a, a type of healthcare and support that works for you and the person that you're caregiving for um, to figure out is this something that could be a support to me that I may be eligible for? I know that decline is going to happen, so how can I find a support system to help me through that? Um, any any good hospice company, whether it's us or anybody else, um, should be able to sit down with you for any consultation and talk with you about your specific situation. Um, so if hospice is an idea, whether it's with Angela, whether it's with another hospice agency, we just want to make sure that we're educating about the benefit and the potential support for people out there in the community. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the share and just open it up for any questions, um, comments that you would like to talk about. Jamie, thank you so very much for your information and for willing to stick around for a few minutes uh, for some Q&A. As everyone has heard, Jamie is uh, available for any uh, questions that you may have, comments that you may have. Uh, I think it's an also a, a good time. And, and Jamie didn't mention this, but Jamie has written um, and produced with our communications team a wonderful workbook on uh, building moments of brilliance. And it's a caregiver's guide to dementia care. It is on our website. Um, you can simply go, uh, to, the best way to go to find it on our uh, website is to go to angelahospice.org. And there's a uh, an area uh, guide that you can uh, download this book. But this is one of Jamie's uh, projects. Uh, that our communications team uh, worked with her and the, um, Jamie, bear with me, Michigan Public Health Institute, is that who gave us funding for that? Correct. Yep. They were having a grant to be able to support dementia care um, in the community, most notably in facilities. And so, um, yeah, I had written this when I first started here at Angela, and we were just lucky enough to be able to get that funding to get it published, and our development team just did a wonderful job with the layout, um, and they did turn, we have um, physical copies of the workbook, but they also turned it into that online fillable workbook as well, so that we we could just make sure the access to it is, is um, great. Excellent, excellent. So like Jamie said, you can uh, log on and uh, get that fillable, um, but take this opportunity at this moment uh, uh, and, and ask any questions that you feel free feel to unmute yourself. If you'd like to put a question in the chat, I can mo uh, monitor that, but it looks like uh, Sherry, are you raising your hand? You have a question? Yes. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to let Jamie know that this timing on her talk was just absolutely excellent for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm dealing with my mom right now, who I suspect has dementia beyond the initial stages. And uh, we're going to be taking her for neuro neurological examination. But she's on a decline very rapidly. Um, she's 91. And um, God bless her soul. But she's she's really on a decline. So I just want you to know that this is perfect. <laughs> Oh, are, did you put the um, the comment about sleeping through the night? No, I didn't put any comments. I've just been oh, listening. Okay. And I oh. jumped on about 10 minutes after you started, so I missed the first 10 minutes. Um, I was at a another event that I had to go to, but um, but thank you. This is super. I'm going to get your book. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And, um, you know, always feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, Jen, is it okay if I read um, the comment out here and answer the question? Absolutely. Please feel free. Go ahead, Jamie. Okay. So it says, my parents live many states away and do not wish to move closer to me or my brother where we could be much more helpful. My mother has fairly advanced dementia and my father also has health concerns. They currently live in their condo alone and we arranged for seven hours of in-home care, five in the morning and two in the evening. He is resistant to moving to any kind of assisted living facility. Uh, Dad gets frustrated and thinks mom is deliberately trying to exacerbate him, despite me gently reminding him that she is not intentionally trying to make him crazy. How do we know when it's time for them to live apart and how do we present it? Um, just a, a real heartbreaking situation. So that is um, one of the most common scenarios that I have, um, that I've, I've seen and worked with. And it's very difficult for caregivers, especially for caregivers who are caregiving at a distance to be able to work through. Um, I find it's frustrating because you have these two adults who were your parents your whole life. And now you really know, and you're seeing things that would help them have a higher quality of life, but they're not able um, to maybe see that or um, figure out what that looks like for themselves. Um, you know, un unfortunately, what I have, what does happen in a lot of these cases is you wait till that crisis moment happens, and then you have to kind of step in and figure out what to do next. Um, but what um, I generally tell people to do, because you don't want to just wait for that crisis moment to happen, um, you want to figure out, well, okay, as a child, how can I help? Um, depending on maybe trying to I have your dad identify what is in his area that he relies on. It sounds like you're doing really, I mean, amazing having that care in the morning and two in the evening. Um, that's a that's a huge step and a huge benefit, but maybe also have him identify in conversation things that, that, that he does um, that maybe can get him, um, maybe give mom some time away from each other to be able to, um, focus on himself and maybe give himself a little bit of a break because it might just be that he's struggling with losing maybe that relationship that he had with his wife um and again i'm just saying just based on some um more broad generalizations but that is something common that i've really seen um it's really hard to know when it's time for them to live apart a lot of those couples that i've worked with they're they're in it to win it. And um, having them live apart is is a really difficult thing. And I haven't found that a lot of children have been completely successful in that and, and stepped up to what you're doing. Um, I think being supportive from afar is the best thing that care is really good um, and really helping find things for your dad to be able to take care of himself and kind of process what, what might be going on with your mom. I hope that's helpful. I can tell that he, the fact that he's accepting that much care in the home is huge. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Nikki, you said you had a question. And before I turn it over to you, Nikki, I just want to uh, just do two things real quick. Somebody mentioned that they had to, um, came a little bit late. Um, just so you know, this is being recorded. And we do post these within a couple of days um, on our website. All of our Angela Cares for the last uh, year and a half ha are posted on our website. So feel free to 
uh, go out and look at that, um, share that with family and friends maybe that couldn't join you today or that you thought were maybe this presentation or any of our other presentations have been insightful. And with that, Nikki, uh, you have a question for Jamie. I do. Thank you. Um, so my scenario is um, my mother used to do so many different hobbies. I, I called her the female MacGyver. I mean, you give her anything, she can make anything. So she has... Um, two whole rooms that are nothing but dedicated to her prior hobbies that due to her cognitive decline, she can no longer participate in them. Um, and she has no interest in them. But at the same time, she will not allow me to get rid of any of those items. But also with her seeing those rooms, it causes conflict with her because she knows that she's no longer able to do what she did in the past. So I'm trying to figure out a way, you know, it's a, it's like a, a fine line, you know, between not wanting to eliminate her past and her history, but also trying to make things easier for her currently so that, you know, seeing all that stuff isn't triggering any, you know, additional negative emotions. So I was just wondering if you have any suggestions on, on how to possibly work with that fine line. So are there any um, like clubs or groups in her area that are, that do the same thing that she, that she liked to do? So like um, maybe name a couple of, maybe some of the things. Oh, she sewed, she makes jewel, she made jewelry, she did woodworking, she did stained glass. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, she did, she did it all. <laughs> Well, you know, um, but the two biggest things were probably sewing and making jewelry. Okay. So I worked with a woman who was in a very similar situation. She was a lifelong quilter. And I mean, her house was just full of quilts, but she couldn't quilt anymore. And so what her and her husband did um, was they found a local quilting club and she actually slowly over time, they made some donations of some of the things to be samples so that she could inspire other quilters. And, and that way she was able to really live vicariously through other, others, knowing that her hobbies didn't just go to waste and sit there. Okay. So I don't know if that would be something to talk through with your mom and say, you know, she could have an involvement and maybe not actually do them, but still still feel a sense of like satisfaction that all of her years of, of, of putting a labor of love into these things, it didn't go to waste. It went to support other people who might also have the same passion um, could be a good option. Okay. Yeah. Cause like uh, she has tons, uh, totes and totes and totes of um, material. And, you know, one day she said, I just want to give it all away. And I said, okay, well, you know, as I'm sure a lot of you know, if you don't act on that decision immediately, 30 minutes later, it can be a totally different decision. So um, it's a pretty big endeavor. And so by the time we started going through that process of getting ready to get rid of some of it, it was a no-go at that point. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about possibly selling it so that that way, kind of the same thing that we know then if somebody's going to pay money for it, that they truly are invested in it and they're looking forward to it. So that's kind of what I've been trying to inch my way towards right now, but it's a very long, lengthy process yeah. um, or, to try or, and convince her that that's the right way to go. <laughs> or another suggestion could be that I've seen done before is when you have a lot of accumulated stuff buying a special like a like a special like um like you know those uh those curio cabinets or uh or like those special wood trunks mm -hmm. letting her select the best of the best and having it in a trunk that was put away but it was still hers if she wanted to go through it so okay. that way it would be um something that would empower her because it would be her decision it would be her things it would give her an opportunity to maybe go through those things um but then she could kind of pack them away and it might be symbolic of kind of closing out that chapter. Yeah. Sometimes, unfortunately, <laughs> though, that process of thinning out overwhelms her yeah. and it we do a decline back again. So, mm -hmm. um, Are there any like younger people in her life? And by younger, I mean like, um, like grandchildren, nieces, nephews. Mm -hmm that she's close with um yeah mm -hmm. 
Are, do any of them show an interest in any of these hobbies? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes I've had um, where people don't want to do it, but they want to watch other people do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track. I just have to stick it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and I can be honest for the person who's watching that process can be really difficult because she might also be having um you know processing letting go too yeah. so it might be some of that grief process that she's going through yeah. so I don't know if maybe she has a trusted advisor um that she maybe confides in or you know somebody she can talk to maybe would also help her process that in a way okay well, thank you very, thank you. very much. Um, Jamie does have one question in the chat. I'll let her address that. And if there's any other questions, we'll have time for one more after that. Uh, please remember that the, Jamie's book is on our AngelaHospice.org website. So Jamie, it's back to you. Um, how do I convince an Alzheimer's person that they need to eat even though they insist they ate already and feel full when I know for a fact they have not eaten yet for the day? Also, this person would rather eat sweets than protein food. Again, I really want to normalize this. This is this is um, very, very common. So one thing I will note that right off the bat is that as as we age, dementia or not, this, the taste buds that pick up sweet tastes are actually the last to go. You, you lose the other taste sensation. So a lot of times um, eating sweets and reaching for those sweeter foods are not uncommon. Um, if you really are concerned about protein intake, one thing that we have done is made Ensure shakes. Um, so using, um, different ice cream, but then putting insure in them with ice and blending them up really quick. And then that's a way to have something that's sweet with also some protein. Um, sometimes the, the need to eat is so frustrating when you see people who are not eating because they think as a society, um, and as loved ones, love is <laughs> love it. Food is love. Uh, food is social. Food is tied to so many different things that when we see people not eating it, 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 provides a very visceral response in people. Um, so number one, I would say that there is there is something that can happen with the brain where you can not feel hungry. And that is something that we talk about a lot in hospice care is as the body shuts down, you're not moving as much, things aren't processing as much, your appetite actually decreases and the ability um, to want to eat decreases and goes away. And that is completely normal. Um, that is something that is that is okay. It's more frustrating and more challenging for the person who is a caregiver to see. Um, again, talking about symptom management and what is going to bring that person quality of life. Um, I would I would look for things that you can integrate that the person really likes to eat. I would also ask, is it um a matter of they're not hungry or are they having difficulty actually eating? Sometimes we find that being able to use utensils become really difficult. So at that point we can talk about what does it look like to go to finger foods? So maybe um, having chicken tenders or French fries or um, you know something that you can eat with your fingers, a half a sandwich, um, small bites. So if you have things like little hors d'oeuvres, cheese and crackers, or just a snack tray, that can be really helpful. Um, a lot of, again, creating a social situation where maybe you're sitting and eating with that person um, can be really helpful because you'll find that sometimes um, just watching somebody else eat is a cue for them to start eating. Let's say you're sitting at a table um, finding the finding out what foods they really enjoyed and figuring out if they're not finger foods, how you could make them into finger foods. Um, those are the suggestions that we've usually used um, in, in working in dementia care. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, ja Jamie. Uh, Jane, you're raising your hand if you'd like to unmute yourself and we will make this our final question. Um, and welcome, uh, Jane. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, thank you so much. A wonderful presentation. Um, I've been an Angela Hospice respite support volunteer since 95, and I tend to be given a lot of the dementia cases. One thing that I'm finding really interesting is just now we're seeing a lot of research linking hearing loss and dementia. And um, I'm finding that really interesting because obviously if you're not hearing, you're less connected to the world and that certainly isn't helping. So just yes, a that's a really great point, Jane. And I also should mention too, that a lot of times as dementia is advanced, your peripheral vision gets eliminated to where you, you can't see that peripheral. So sometimes um, it's difficult. Like if you're trying to talk to somebody or show somebody something, and maybe you're on a different side from them, they might not, might not see what you're trying to do as well. So. Thank you so much. I do have to, I do have to thank you all so very much. Um, I do have to run to my next um, engagement, but um please feel free to reach out to us if there are any questions or comments. And we just really appreciate that you've been here today with us.